Hello everyone, welcome to my YouTube channel. This is Sir Steven and for today we will talk about the infections of histological importance as a part of your medical histology or pathology laboratory series. A number of infections may be diagnosed from the characteristic appearances as you see in your biopsy specimens and in some cases the diagnosis may first be suspected when a biopsy is examined by light microscopy. In other cases, the clinician suspects an infective agent and seeks confirmation by biopsy as well as by other means. Although your histological appearances are often characteristic, it is usually necessary to confirm the presence of the infective agent by other techniques such as microbiological cultures or serology. In addition, the pathologist may employ a lot of methods or techniques such as electron microscopy, immunohistochemical staining with specific monoclonal antibodies and a range of special stains to confirm the diagnosis. A lot of infections that are otherwise difficult to diagnose arise in your immunocompromised patients, for example patients with HIV or AIDS and organ transplant recipients, and as the number of such patients increases, so the role of your histopathology in diagnosis of infection expands. This presentation aims to give you an overview of infections that are important in routine diagnostic pathological practice and to illustrate the appearances of these organisms in the tissues and to consider the patterns of tissue damage they cause. Let's start with bacterial infections. Most of your bacteria cause disease by exciting an acute exudative inflammatory response in the case of pyogenic bacteria. This inflammatory exudate is responsible for many of the clinical features of your disease such as your low-born pneumonia. More complex mechanisms are involved in the tissue damage caused by infection with the bacteria such as your Helicobacter pylori, which cause inflammation by interfering with your normal physiological reg regulation of gastric acid secretion. Other bacteria will cause disease by producing toxins which induce the necrosis of cells and tissues such as your Clostridium difficile toxins will destroy the surface epithelium of your colon. Some bacteria initiate your type 4 sensitivity reactions such as your mycobacteria and some triponema organisms and so they produce characteristic changes. In pseudomembranous colitis, there is your focal necrosis of the surface epithelium of the colon. This necrotic epithelium is replaced by an area of membrane which is composed of predominantly fibrinous acute inflammatory exudates. Typically, it happens in older people following treatment with certain antibiotics. The antibiotic destroys the natural bacterial flora, allowing uncontrolled uh, multiplication of your Clostridium difficile. This bacterium produces a toxin which causes extensive colonic epithelial necrosis and may be fatal. So here, you will see a pattern of superficial mucosal necrosis which is a characteristic of this slide. There are multiple focal lesions of your necrosis with tufts of exudates in letter E. These are your exudates, likened to an erupting volcano. The deep components also of your mucosa have been largely intact, but the superficial parts of the colonic crypts in C appear acutely inflamed and atrophic, so they decrease in size. These bacteria are the filamentous bacteria which grow in characteristic fungal-like colonies, appearing uh, grossly as yellow sulfur granules and causing chronic abscesses and fistulation. Your typical sites of infection include the oral cavity, your lung, your GI tract, your female genital tract, which is linked to the use of your intrauterine contraceptive devices. And this figure, it shows an actinomyces in letter A that lie within a pool of pus in letter P and appear encrusted by your eosinophilic material which is we call the splendory hopley phenomenon which is the filamentous shape of your bacteria the FB can be seen at the edges of the colonies so you'll see it here in your actinomyces next is your mycobacterial infections Infections caused by various mycobacteria can be frequently be diagnosed histologically because of the tissue reaction to their presence. The organisms are difficult and slow to grow in microbiological culture and therefore biopsy often plays an important role in early diagnosis. Mycobacterium tuberculosis will cause your tuberculosis, a disease that is increasing in incidence because of the emergence of drug-resistant strains. Mycobacterium leprae is the cause of leprosy. 
And it's important to note about the histology of your mycobacterial infections which are most likely showing a granulomatous pattern of chronic inflammation due to a delayed type hypersensitivity reaction. We have also Cassius necrosis for M. tuberculosis infections. Suporating granulomas, these are with occurring in infections of atypical mycobacteria. Well, these organisms are also referred to as mycobacteria other than tuberculosis or non-tuberculous mycobacteria. The causative organism can sometimes be identified in histological sections by the use of special stains such as your Zeal, Nielsen, and Wade fight. This is a of micrograph of the early pulmonary tuberculosis in letter A. This is an early tubercle in medium power. Letter B, this is an early tubercle in high power. Letter A shows an entire tubercle at an early stage. In B, it illustrates a sector of the same tubercle at higher magnification. At the center of the tubercle is an area of Cassius necrosis, let CN, containing the mycobacteria. These can only be demonstrated by specific staining methods for acid-fast bacilli, and the Cassius area is surrounded by a zone of epithelioid macrophages in letter M with abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm. Some of the macrophages fuse to produce your multinucleate giant cells and they are called Langhans giant cells in letter L. A typical Langhans giant cell is shown here. This is letter C and letter D. The C is the later tubercle in medium power and the letter D is your later tubercle, tubercle in high power. With a further development of your spindle-shaped fibroblast in letter F appearing in the peripheral lymphocytic zone of the tubercle, they are stimulated by factors produced by the epithelioid macrophages to lay down collagen in your extracellular tissue. This process is evident in letter C and at higher magnification in letter D. So remember the labels. This is a fibrocaceous tuberculous nodule in low power. And in most cases of your primary tuberculosis, the GON focus heals by fibrosis, which leaves a small fibrous nodule, which is often calcified. Some individuals are unable to contain the initial infection and develop your post-primary tuberculosis. A thick fibrous wall in letter W completely encircles a mass of cautious necrotic material in CN. In this case, there is a little calcification. This is a tuberculous lymph node in low power. With the for formation of your gone focus in a child's lung, your tubercle bacilli via your lung lymphatics to the regional lymph nodes where they inf um, initiate cassius necrosis and tubercle formation similar to that in the lung. Here, the tubercle has uh, greatly enlarged so that the lymph node has almost been destroyed by the cassius necrosis in letter C. And the zone of your cellular reaction around it is very thin. Necrosis has almost reached the lymph node capsule and the rupture is imminent. This is tuberculous bronchopneumonia in medium power. In this example of an early lesion in tuberculous bronchopneumonia, we note a bronchiole containing infected material. The walls of your bronchiole are indicated by the arrows, mark letter B. And a segment of the bronchiolar wall has been destroyed in letter D, permitting access of the bacilli which have uh, initiated a cassiating tubercle in letter T in the nearby, nearby long parenchyma. Large numbers also of lesions may form, merging with one another to produce a, a, lot of, a wide area of rapidly enlarging cassiation. Usually, we see it in the lower lobes of your lungs. This is the pathogenesis of the once dreaded galloping consumption. This is your disseminated tuberculosis in liver, letter A, in medium power. Letter B is in your kidney in medium power. In A, it shows several miliary tubercles in letter T in your liver. One of the tubercles exhibits uh, Langhans giant cells in letter L, and the larger tubercle shows early central Cassius necrosis. Letter B illustrates a renal involvement with the formation of small tubercles in letter D in the renal cortex. Continuation of this process will result in destruction of much of the renal cortex and the medulla. And with the eventual rupture of large confluent tubercles into your pelvic calyxial system, 
which becomes more distended with gaseous material. This condition is what we call as here tuberculous pyonephrosis and in most advanced cases, the infection spreads to involve the ureter and the bladder. Renal tuberculosis is frequently bilateral and may result in renal failure. This is your bone letter C in medium power and letter D is your tuberculous meningitis in medium power. Bone tuberculosis or what we call as your tuberculous osteomyelitis is the most frequently affecting your long bones. Associated with your joints and your vertebra, the POTS disease, in your long bones, the infection may produce a localized painful swelling which may drain to the skin to form a chronic sinus. Joint involvement, such as in the form of tuberculous arthritis, is the most common in children and often affects the hips or your joints associated with the vertebrae, which is the tuberculous spondylitis as a part of POTS disease of the spine. As in other tissues, letter C will show you the characteristic caseating granulomas in letter G, which cause the progressive destruction of your bony tuberculae in letter BO. Tuberculous meningitis is an uncommon but frequently fatal complication of your tuberculosis. Most often, it affects the meninges around the base of the brain and the spinal cord. As shown in letter D, your tuberculous granulomas and G, which uh, with the characteristic sin uh, the central areas of cassiation, will develop in the leptomeninges and the adjacent brain tissue. This is an atypical mycobacterial infection involving your lymph node in medium power. It shows a lymph node from an otherwise healthy child with your MOTT infection, and the lymphoid tissue is replaced with a granulomatous inflammatory response. It consists of a confluent sheets of epithelioid macrophages, and in contrast to M. tuberculosis, the granulomas and MOTT infection show superative ne necrosis with an aggregate of um, neutrophils in letter N rather than caches necrosis. As in this example, the giant cells may be sparse. This is leprosy in letter A. This is a dermal infiltration in low power. Leprosy is a disease caused by the infection of your mycobacterium lepri. The tissue reaction to the bacillus depends on the immune response of the infected person. In the tuberculoid form of the disease, there is an active cell-mediated immune response and the granulomas are formed that are similar to those seen in tuberculosis. But without the evidence of cassiation, in your lepromatous form, there is no effective cell-mediated immune response and tissues are infiltrated with macrophages colonized by large numbers of bacteria. Intermediate forms of leprosy exist with both your tuberculoid and lepromatous features. Letter A is a micrograph of the skin of a person with tuberculoid leprosy, histiocytic granulomas in letter G, with a heavy surrounding lymphocytic infiltrate, are present at all layers throughout the dermis, but particularly in relation to small nerves. This has illustrated the higher magnification in letter B. Here, a small dermal nerve DN is shown surrounded by a cuff of lymphocytes. There is also an associated granuloma. Special staining of mycobacteria using different stains. Letter, letter A is zeal nielsen stain in tuberculosis and high power. Letter B is the wade fight stain in lep lepromatous uh, leprosy in high power. M. tuberculosis and atypical mycobacteria are not visible on routine H and E stains. And to demonstrate the presence of mycobacteria in tissue, the zeal nielsen stain method is employed. This stain is taken up by the cell walls of your mycobacteria and remains despite treatment with acid and alcohol. This is the origin of the term acid and alcohol fast bacilli which is used in describing mycobacteria. In a very high power micrograph, letter A, scattered magenta colored rod-shaped organisms can be seen in the lung of your immunocompromised patient. Some carbon pigment, letter C, can be identified within your alveolar macrophages. The micrograph of lepromatous leprosy shows the weight fight stain, which is a modified version of your zeal nielsen stain. Again, it stains the organisms red. The similarity in appearance between your M. tuberculosis and M. lepre can be readily appreciated. Moving forward with the spirochete infections, and the most major form of your spirochete infection worldwide is syphilis due to the treponema pallidum. 
yaws and pinta are further important trypanemal infections, but these are rare except in specific tropical regions. Although now relatively uncommon, late-stage syphilis is still regarded as one of the classical examples of specific chronic inflammation. The infecting organism, the spiral-shaped spirochene T. pallidum, resists usual tissue defenses and excites a progression of fascinating pathological and clinical phenomena, which represent typical chronic inflammatory responses with superimposed hypersensitivity reactions mounted by your immune system. The condition usually proceeds through three stages over a long period. In brief, the organism usually gains access to the body by penetrating the genital mucosa where it produces a single small primary lesion known as your chancre. The chancre and your concomitant bacteremia or the primary syphilis are followed some weeks or months later by a transient secondary stage. In most untreated cases, the infection is effectively resolved by body defenses and in many of these patients, even serological evidence of your previous infection will disappear. Unfortunately, a proportion of untreated cases proceed from the secondary stage to develop your tertiary syphilis after a variable interval from one to many years. This is your syphilis. Letter A is the syphilitic gamma of the liver in low power, and this is your letter B, which is the syphilitic aortitis in medium power. Letter A will illustrate the classic appearance of gamma with central homogeneous coagulative necrosis in letter N, surrounded by a zone of epithelioid macrophages, lymphocytes, plasma cells, and plump fibroblasts. Fibrous healing of the liver, gammas may produce a pattern of coarse, deep scars dividing the liver surface into numerous irregular lobules. This condition is known as your hepar lobatum. Letter B is illustrating a syphilitic aortitis, the most common form of diffuse tertiary syphilitic lesions, which is a characteristic feature of syphilis with a low-grade chronic vasculitis of small vessels with thickening of the wall, particularly your endothelium, and a perivascular cough of lymphocytes and plasma cells. We call it the um, endotheritis obliterans. In the aorta, the vasculitis affects the vasa vasorum of the tunica and adventitia and the smaller branches that extend into your tunica media. Moving forward, the viral infections will cause disease in three main ways. By causing the death of the cell they infect, either by a direct effect or by modifying the genome such that the host cell is recognized as foreign and is destroyed by your host immune system. By causing also an excessive proliferation of your infected cell line, which may result in the development of malignant tumors. Example of that is your human papillomavirus, particularly important in this respect. And by integrating themselves in the cell nucleus where they produce latent infection. AIDS. One of viral infection of a particular importance is your human immunodeficiency virus or HIV which is the cause of your acquired immune deficiency syndrome, such as your AIDS. The, most, uh, the two main consequences of the immunodeficiency state seen in AIDS are, first is the predisposition to opportunistic infections, particularly pneumocystis pneumonia, cytomegalovirus infection, mycobacterial infections, tuberculosis, as well as your atypical mycobacteria, mucocutaneous and other fungal infections including cryptococcus, toxoplasmosis, and also predisposition to certain tumors, particularly Kaposi sarcoma and Hodgkin's lymphoma, especially your diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. This is your herpes virus infection in your skin, letter A, in low power, and letter B, this is your esophagus in high power. Letter A will show you a skin biopsy from a patient with um, HSV2 infection and at low power, there is vesiculation in letter V due to hydropic degeneration and necrosis of your epithelial cells. Letter B show you a high power image of an esophageal biopsy from a patient undergoing chemotherapy from gastric carcinoma. There is a severe inflammation of the squamous mucosa and numerous intranuclear eosinophilic inclusion bodies in letter I. It can be seen within the nuclei pushing the hyperchromatic host chromatin to the periphery. This consists of masses of virus particles. Another characteristic feature is fusion of epithelial cells 
to form your multinucleate um, syncytia, letter S, and these nuclei contain inclusions and typically mold together within the cells. This is your cytomegalovirus infection in high power. CMV pneumonitis is shown here, and the characteristic feature is markedly enlarged cells with large, dark staining, intranuclear inclusion bodies in letter I. These are surrounded by a clear halo. Cytoplasmic inclusions may be seen but are not illustrated in this micrograph, and there is sometimes focal necrosis, but there is usually minimal, if any, inflammation. Cytomegalic inclusions are usually seen in epithelial cells, endothelial cells, and in macrophages, as in the case of in other herpes virus infections, these inclusions may be sparse. Human papillomavirus in high power. This is the causative agent of the common viral skin warts and genital warts. High-risk types of the virus are closely associated with cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, CIN, and with invasive squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix, vagina, vulva, anogenital region, and other sites such as your oropharynx. The epithelium is usually thickened or acanthotic or may have the papillary appearance of an exophytic wart, condolima acuminatum, and this infection of your cells in the upper layers of your epithelium will produce enlargement of your nuclei. They are hyperchromatic and have a folded appearance. A prominent cytoplasmic halo is also seen, and these cells are called coilocytes in letter K. In addition, the epithelium contains binucleate cells in letter B and dyskeratotic cells in letter D, for example, in the individual cell keratinization. Next is fungal infections. The inflammatory reaction in fungal infections may have one of three patterns. The classical appearance of a granulomatous inflammation which may be exhibiting central superative necrosis. The second pattern is of acute inflammation with an infiltrate consisting primarily of neutrophils. This pattern is seen in candida infection of your esophagus. The third is a very minimal inflammatory response as in super infections of the skin by your dermatophytic fungi. Fungi are not usually obvious in the routine h &E staining, but the thick cell walls are highlighted by special stains such as your periodic acid shift or silver stain. Some fungi are easily recognized histologically because of the characteristic shape and structure of the hyphae and the pattern of budding of your yeast forms. Despite this, the culture techniques are preferable for definitive identification of fungal species. An important diagnostic point is that the presence of fungal yeast forms such as candida at the mucosal surface or, in, or on the skin. And it does not have necessarily indicate active infection as these agents are common commensals. Evidence of active invasion must be demonstrated and in most cases, there is an appropriate inflammatory response. This is candidiasis. Letter A is an oral candidiasis in your PAS stain in high power. Letter B is your esophageal candidiasis, PAS stain in high power. And letter C is your myocardial candidiasis in PAS 10 in high power. Candida albicans is an ubiquitous commensal fungus on the epithelial surface of your skin, your mouth, and the genital tract. It exists in both hyphal, mycelial form, and as rounded yeasts. Although usually commensal, it, become, it can become pathogenic, usually producing reddening and soreness of the affected epithelium, often with a whitish surface membrane comprising excess keratin production and the fungal hyphae. Letter A shows a candidal infection mainly in hyphal forms in letter H on the surface of the buccal epithelium from a case of oral thrush in a patient taking antibiotics. Letter B, it shows abundant candidal infection both in hyphal, letter H, and yeast, letter Y, forms in the esophagus of an elderly man debilitated by terminal cancer. There is also abundant necrotic debris, letter N, D, forming a thick surface membrane. The infection had started a severe oropharyngeal thrush but had spread down in his esophagus. Letter C is showing a candida yeast forms in giant cells in letter G in the myocardium, forming a small granuloma 
and often the bloodstream spread of candidas produces small abscesses filled with neutrophils such as your pus but this patient was severely immunocompromised and was unable to mount an acute inflammatory reaction aspergillus is a ubiquitous fungus that may cause an allergic pulmonary response in otherwise healthy individuals this is also known as colloquially as brewer's lung and belongs to the group of diseases known as the term extrinsic allergic alveolitis. In this case, the aspergillus does not colonize or invade the lung. Asthmatic inv- individuals may have their bronchial tree colonized by aspergillus without invasion. They are then likely to suffer from an exacerbation of their asthma as a result of an allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. This is hypersensitivity response to aspergillus antigens to which they are constantly exposed. Aspergillus may also colonize pre-existing abscess cavities, classically old tuberculous cavities, where it may form a fungus ball or aspergilloma. Invasive aspergillus infections occur in individuals who are immunosuppressed. Letter A shows you a medium power of an invasive aspergillus infection in the lung, a mass of aspergillus hyphae in letter A, is surrounded by an inflammatory infiltrate in letter I, consisting mainly of neutrophils. Adjacent to this, there is a zone of necrotic lung tissue in letter N, which is the high-power micrograph showing you the mass of your aspergillus hyphae. These characteristically branch at an acute angle as shown in letter C, where the hyphae are also septate. The hyphae have divisions or septa in letter S, that divide them into segments. The typical appearance of aspergillus on a silver stain is shown in letter D, which shows the fungal hyphae clearly. Letter E shows a mass of hyphae of aspergillus niger in letter H and an inflammatory cells in letter I from the external ear canal of a patient with chronic otitis externa. In the center of the field, there are two characteristic fruiting bodies, letter F or, or the conidia, are similar also to the fruiting bodies of the aspergillus species except that they are pigmented. The brownish-black pigment is visible around the periphery of a fruiting body and gives rise to the name aspergillus niger. This is the common cause of your chronic otitis externa and infection of the outer ear, mainly the auditory canal. This is pneumocystis in the lung. Letter A is in your H and E, medium power. Letter B is in your silver stain, high power. The organism Pneumocystis gervichii, formerly known as your Pneumocystis carinae, was previously classified as a protozoan, but more recently has become clear that it's a member of a um, fungal family. The diagnosis may be difficult and transbronchial lung biopsy is often required, and with routine H and E staining, letter A, the organisms may not be apparent. The alveoli are uh, filled with a foamy acellular exudate letter E, with an interstitial infiltrate of lymphocytes in letter L in the alveolar wall. The inflammatory infiltrate may uh, be minimal or more severe, showing features of a diffuse alveolar damage with hyaline membranes, capillary dilatation, and exudation of red cells. Demonstration of the organisms require a silver stain as shown in letter B, and these organisms are cup-shaped and measure 4 to 6 micrometers. This is Cryptococcus in letter A in brain, H and E section, medium power. Letter B is Alcyon blue stain, high power. Letter C is your Muki Carmin stain in high power. Cryptococcus neoformans is another yeast that causes serious infections in many tissues, mainly in your immunosuppressed individuals, such as patients with AIDS, hematological malignancy, and transplant recipients. Occasionally, however, it may cause meningitis, meningoencephalitis or lung infection in an otherwise well individual. Letter A shows you a typical appearance of cryptococcus in your brain. The organisms are seen of forming a cyst in a virtual robin perivascular space. These lesions are known as a soap bubble lesions. The cryptococci, letter C, have a thick surrounding capsule that appears as a clear space. This capsule is an important virulence factor as it inhibits phagocytosis of the organisms and reduced normal leukocyte migration. Typically, there is a minimal inflammatory response which may be due to the immunosuppressed state of the patient. 
However, in chronic infections in uh, non-immunosuppressed individuals, the organisms may incite a granulomatous response. B and C show other special staining techniques that are useful in highlighting cryptococci. The organism's thick polysaccharide capsule, letter CAP, can be stained using Alcyon Blue as illustrated in um, letter B. Here, the nuclei of surrounding cells are counter-stained red. Letter C shows a brain's tissue stained using the mu muki Carmen method. The cryptococci organisms are surrounded by thick magenta-colored capsules. Lastly, your protozoa and helminths. Of the wide range of protozoa that are pathological importance, only a few are usually diagnosed histologically. Protozoa are unicellular organisms that may reproduce asexually or sexually. Many have a complex life cycle involving one or more animal hosts. This is your geriasis in high power. Giardia lamblia is a common protozoan parasite which causes diarrhea. The organism is spread via contaminated water and is more common in institutionalized and immunocompromised patients. Diagnosis is commonly made by biopsy of your small intestine and the Giardia organisms in letter G are seen on the surface of the villi, letter V. A few erythrocytes in letter E are also seen where the mucosa may appear normal or may be inflamed sometimes resembling celiac disease. Next is Trichomonas vaginalis in your Papanicalu stain. High power. This flagellated protozoan parasite commonly infects the female genital tract, presenting with itching and a frothy greenish vaginal discharge. The organisms in letter O are appearing pear shape or ovoid and are somewhat smaller than the surrounding squamous epithelial cells in letter S. The organisms stain a smudgy gray-green gray color. Indistinct nuclei and red cytoplasmic granules may also be seen. The flagella are not usually identifiable on routine preparations. The surrounding epithelial cells may show reactive changes and scattered neutrophil polymorphs may also be present. Cerebral malaria in high power. Malaria, which is caused by four species of protozoan plasmodium, is the common in tropics and subtropics is a more co a major cause of mortality. After entering the blood via the proboscis of your mosquito, the merozoites enter your, your erythrocytes. The cerebral tissue is character characteristically congested, as shown here, where a dilated small blood vessel is packed with erythrocytes, within which the malaria parasites can be seen as dark brown dots. The other species that cause malaria are called P. vivax, P. ovale, P. malariae, which cause a much milder illness that may be recurrent. Your P. falciparo may cause severe anemia, pulmonary edema, renal failure, shock, hypoglycemia, and cerebral disease. Next is your infections with your Entamoeba histolica happening worldwide. The organism is restricted to humans and it is estimated that about 10% of the world's population may carry the organism in the colon. The most common form of infection is amoebic dysentery, where your Entamoeba invade the mucosa of the colon and the rectum, which cause a painful bloody diarrhea. It shows here the organisms in A adherent to the colonic mucosa, the entamoeba are slightly larger than a macrophage and character characteristically phagocytose erythrocytes, which is visible within the organisms. The organisms may invade and obstruct colonic arteries, causing superimposed ischemic necrosis. The organism is spread to the liver, causing an amoebic abscess, and thence the lung or pleural, peritoneal, or the pericardial cavities. Next is your schistosomiasis, a systemic parasitic infection caused by the organism, the organism Schistosoma, a genus of trematode worms or the flukes. Th three species are of pathological importance and their life cycle includes water snails, their intermediate host, and the humans as your definite host. Becoming infected by bathing or working in water containing the larvae or the cercaria released from the snails. Letter A show the low power of your schistosome eggs, SE in the small intestine, 
and usually the part of the adult worm W is seen. Letter B shows two schistosome eggs, the SE, at high power. The groups R of eggs are surrounded by the epithelioid cells, letter E, the giant cells in letter G, and the eosinophils. And these eggs of each species can be identified by their sizes, the position of the spine, which in this case is terminally located and therefore likely to come from S. hematobium. Lastly, your interobius vermicularis in your appendix. Letter A is your low power, letter B is medium power, letter C is high power. Enterobius vermicularis is also known as your pinworm or threadworm. The organism is spread by the fecal-oral route and is commonly present within the lumen of the vowel, particularly in children. The organisms do not invade the tissues. The female worm lays eggs in the perianal area and symptoms, if any, tend to be of perineal irritation. The adult worms inhabit the iliocasal uh, area and are most commonly identified in the appendix. Letter A is showing you the tip of your appendix, section longitudinally. Adult worms are visible within the lumen, one shown in histology, um, longitudinal section in letter L. Note that the normal reactive lymphoid tissue within the wall of the appendix. Typically, there is no tissue reaction associated with the presence of the parasites and the normal appendicial mucosa. With its associated lymphoid tissue can be seen at higher magnification in letter B. Letter C, showing you a transverse section through an adult worm, lying within the lumen of the appendix. Again, note that there is no invasion of the mucosa in letter M. The thick cuticle of the worm has a typical alar projection in letter AP on each side and the esophagus and other internal structures of the worm can also be seen. And that's it for the infections of histological importance. Up next is the disorders of growth in your medical histology and parasito and uh, pathology laboratory. Thank you so much for watching and have a nice day.